Thank you, everyone. We'll get started. If there's folks still having tea or coffee, we could invite them in. <coughs> uh, welcome on behalf of Brookings India to the launch of our electricity and carbon tracker. I'm Rahul Tongia, scholar, and I'm interested in all things energy. And you'll see snippets of something very important. Uh, is there a clicker? Or, um, next slide. And so this is actually a very interesting session where we have several things going on all at once. And we have an excellent panel um, really bringing some of these issues all together. But um, if you could please advance the slide. Sorry? Oh, you have to turn these on, yes. So a lot of the discussion in energy has been this phrase transition. And most analyses have looked at energy or kilowatt hours. And for the first time, we are able to uh, go look at not just energy kilowatt, hour, uh, kilowatt hours, but kilowatts, which is the real challenge going forward. And so this is something that's well recognized by scholars, by planners, by government officials. And so this is the first public attempt at putting all of this together. And so this is the website, carbontracker.in. So everyone is now free to go to this website, play with it, get some insights, have conversations. Uh, we can discuss more underlying data as well. And so this is now the first uh, public availability of this. Now the name Carbon Tracker is very carbon centric. So this is actually electricity and carbon tracker, but we realize no one wants to type such a long keyword. So we do not yet have full carbon into this. We don't do industrial carbon emissions. This is electricity carbon emissions, but those are still a very large fraction of India's total carbon emissions. So the agenda today is introduce the demo. Uh, sorry, and, and demo the tracker. My colleagues Utkarsh Dalal and Tabish Pare are my co-conspirators in, in this effort. We have a discussion paper that is available on our website with insights and findings. We'll share only a few highlights from this. What does it mean to go beyond daily numbers to real-time numbers? What did, what did you learn? Then we've also launched this new report. Uh, which is also on our website, which answers this very critical question that we are a country of 350 plus gigawatts of installed capacity, but the maximum load met has been in the order of 180, 182. So does this mean we have huge surplus? Is that the stranded asset problem or non-performing asset problem? It's more complicated than that, and so this report really helps us understand that issue. And then, of course, we have a fantastic panel discussion uh, with experts and uh, actual decision makers from CEA, MOP, and uh, from Terry. And so, given all that we want to cover, I think we'll get done by 8 p.m. No. <laughs> no, we will actually keep it brief, hopefully keep it focused, and request to all the audience members when, as we open it up to discussions, let's keep it short and pointed so we can have more discussion as well. Next slide, please. So I now request my colleague Utkarsh to demo the tracker. So this is the experience and some insights when you go to, w, no www, just carbontracker.in. Utkarsh, over to you. Um, do we have a handheld mic? I can use this one. Yeah. Oh, here. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm just gonna walk through the actual tracker. So when you log on to the web page, um, this is what you'll see. So this is the generation over the past week. So whatever week you're in, it'll show you that generation. Um, and it shows you the generation by source over time. So for example, over here, um, the gray patch is thermal generation. The light blue is hydro. Dark blue is gas, red is nuclear, and yellow is renewable. At the very top also we have uh, demand met. So that's the total demand um, of the country at, the, at whatever time it is. And, and these are the five minute 
resolutions. Yes, it's, it's at a five minute interval level. And at the bottom, we also have the corresponding CO2 emissions. So we have total CO2 emissions over five minutes uh, in green. And then in purple, we have the CO2 intensity. So we can also say we want to zoom in to just one day rather than you know seeing, seeing this whole week. Uh, we can just kind of click and drag and it'll zoom in. And this moves as well when we, when we zoom in. So the bottom plot is always corresponding to the top plot. And if we want to go back, we can always use the auto scale or also reset axes. They do the same thing. We can zoom this way as well. Um, and then once we have actually zoomed in, we can also nicely pan and just look over a day. So say we're starting on the 27th, we can you know, go right, uh, left or right and see both of these charts moving. Uh, one other interesting thing is that we can, oops, sorry, we can um, sorry, just give me a second, reset axes. Uh, we can also see other, we can uh, turn off some of these um, areas on the, on the chart. So we can say we don't want to see renewable generation. We want to see what the duck curve looks like, right? So we can just click on this and renewable generation will go off. Uh, but everything else remains. Uh, we can also turn off, say, demand met. And now say we want to put them back and we also want to see additional things which are not displayed by default. Uh, for example, the, the daily high or the daily low, which is over a 24-hour daily period. So we can see, see these two as well. So we, uh, you, know, we can, you can see the gap. And over a longer range, uh, you can see that gap uh, change. Uh, so let's move on to one of the next tabs that we have, which, which has some of the other features of the tracker. Mention how we get there. There's a pull down at the top. Yes, sorry. So to get to, say, well, let's look at this one. This is weekly moving averages. So to get to here, uh, we go up here and we click on this pull down. And by default, it's showing corrected generation data. We just have to go down and click on weekly moving averages and set the range. So you can set either a range, or you can look at a specific week or a month. So the raw data has a bunch of uh, errors in it, so random spikes, things like that. So uh, it's just correct some small corrections that we have done to make it more uh, consistent. Um, so here we're looking at the weekly moving averages from November, which is when we first started getting this data, to today. Um, we can see how these have changed. So uh, this one at the top is demand met. The one at the bottom is thermal generation. So the moving average of thermal generation seems to actually be going down, whereas um, this one has not gone down as much. Uh, if we look at some of the other uh, moving averages, such as uh, renewable and hydro, we see that these have also started going up You know, sometime in April onwards. So. Um, you know, from this we can tell that these are the these are the ones that are making up uh, the increase in demand rather than thermal. Um, so let's move on to the next tab, which is the load duration curve. This is the amount of time at, on the x-axis and the megawatts in descending order on the y-axis. So basically, the uh, the highest amount of megawatts and the amount of time that it's spent at that uh, at that generation level. Uh, here we can also turn on the corresponding uh, types of generation, so we can see at each uh, at each type uh, sorry at each um, demand what the corresponding type of generation was. So this is not chronological. This is uh, in in descending order of demand over time. Uh, we can also see the percentage of that time uh, over here at the top. So say we want to see the top 10% of, of demand, we can zoom in like that. And we see that it uh, was you know, somewhere around 170 or 160 something. Why is not perfectly flush to the here? Because, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then finally, let's go to the summary statistics. So these are just some interesting statistics um, over the period up here. So for example, the total generation, the, the total renewable generation, how much of the total generation was renewable, um, how, much, uh, how many tons of CO2 were emitted. 
as well as other interesting statistics such as uh, what what was the average daily max over the period, uh, average daily max generation, average da daily min generation, uh, the number of days with peaks in specific uh, time periods. Um, so this may not be so useful over the whole range, but if you look at it, say, over a season, you can see the peaks shift from uh, morning peaks to evening peaks. Like, for example, in the winter time, most of the peaks are in the morning. And then as you start looking at, at the summer, uh, they, they start shifting uh, later and later in the day. Uh, you can also look at, you know, the period max generation, uh, the time of the maximum um, carbon intensity and the time of the max, uh, minimum carbon intensity as well. Um, and then this final tab is just the first one, the corrected generation, except over the entire period. So, you know, we can just see some, some things that strike the eye like directly from it, uh, including the fact that hydro is increasing um, as, uh, as the amount of generation. And then if we can go back to the slides, there are some uh, caveats with the, with the data. Aditi? Okay, so about the data. So the generation is only grid level. So we don't have any captive power or rooftop generation included in this. Um, it's all from the SCADA data. Um, so uh, in addition to that, we defined generation, um, load met consumption differently. So the generation is just the the sum of the types of generation, but it only includes SCADA data. It doesn't include um, uh, imports from Bhutan. And, but the SCADA data is not complete. It's missing some renewable generation, which uh, Tabish will talk about later. Um, uh, the demand is defined as the demand at the state boundary. So the, uh, uh, so this is after losses and generation, losses. interstate losses, yes. And um, that's why generation is a few percentage higher than demand. Okay. And so we also have some limitations. Uh, for example, we have some errors in the data as well as missing, uh, missing data. We've corrected the errors as far as we could. The missing data we have not done anything with, so you may see some kind of like frozen, frozen time periods. Um, in addition to that, the carbon emissions are based on a static multiplier. Uh, these are provided by a report from the CEA. Uh, so they, you know, they don't take into account uh, PLF, uh, plant, plant level variances, etc. And um, we don't have state level data, which again, Tabish and Rahul will talk about later. Moving on, or not, oh, sorry. Okay, so Tabish, you wanna come up? Thank you, Utkarsh. So now we will look at some of the findings, preliminary findings from the data. And they're in the report. And yeah, they are in the discussion note that we uploaded. So you can, I'll just skim through them. You can find a detailed understanding of them in the report. Okay, so, yeah. So firstly, if you look at the daily highs and daily lows, so the highest total generation and the lowest total generation, we see that the band, the difference between them has been decreasing from winters, from December till July, till June 31st. So till now we were only being reported the daily highs, but now we have the daily lows and the daily lows is an important number. When you have to see how much, especially with more RE coming in, how much can you ramp down your capacity. So we see that earlier you could, there was a higher ramping requirement, but now as we approach summers, the ramping requirement is a bit lower. Yeah. So I think Utkarsh already told you about the load duration curve. Let's just focus on one interesting point. So the RE is not going according to the load duration curve. Definitely. But one thing is interesting is it's saying to you that, hey, I will not be there when you don't need me. So it will not be there when you need it, but it definitely is not there when you don't need it. <laughs> so finally, if we zoom into the top 1% of the demand for the past seven months, that's like 60 hours. We see that almost 5.5 gigawatts of capacity is only on for 60 hours. And that's an interesting question. Which capacity should it be? 
which will have a PLF of, I don't know, less than maybe 1%. So that's something we as planners, policymakers need to discuss and the government especially. And this is just an average load curve for the month of December. Here we see that it's, we have a small duck, but I mean, it's relatively flat as most of India's load curves are. So we have, firstly, you see the first red line, that's the median daytime peak. The daytime peak is between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. So we see that's hovering around 10. And then we have the median daily peak, which is for the whole duration of 24 hours. And that's also in the morning, heavily. And then we have the median renewable peak, which is somewhere around 12. If we move on, now these are the same curves for the seven months from December to June. We see that although the renewable median peak remains almost constant, it doesn't move around because, I mean, solar is a major contributor and comes up in the day, so definitely it affects it. But we see that the daily peak has shifted from morning to evening. And then, especially in the months of May and June, it has almost gone past 10. So uh, this is a median, so we will have some peaks at 12, some peaks at 8. So this is another change that's happening. And we see that the daily load curve is also a bit more flat. On the other hand, the median day, daytime peak, we see that before the month of February, it was around 10. But after that, it has also shifted somewhere post noon. So, yeah. And then what we thought to do was, since we have TOD-based data and some of the most interesting times are the morning and the evening, because that's when we have ramping high demands. So we just wanted to, just a disclaimer that correlation, of course, is not causality. So we're just looking at how do these generations relate with each other? Who is ramping up, who is ramping down, and how are they interacting with each other? Of course, when the system changes, these will change because they are not exactly dependent upon each other. But oh, so we were, one of the interesting questions was how does, who balances RE and how much? So we, here we see the first chart. We see that RE is being strongly negatively correlated with hydro, suggesting, though not like saying directly, that hydro is playing a major role in balancing of RE. And similarly, we have others, you can look at it more later. But so I'll just try to say that we also, this is a weekly correlations. So we see that although correlations vary over TOD, like in the morning it's different, in the evening for the same set of generations it's different, but also over time. In winters you have different kinds of correlations than in summers. Okay, I think it's not moving. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so now we, also looked at the 15 minute ramp rates. Who is providing how much ramp in a 15 minute time slot? How much it's changing? And we found, uh, as you can see, it's a thermal ramping, gas ramping, hydro, RE, and demand met ramping. And the lines that you see in each of them is this weekly moving standard deviation. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Okay, how is it working? Okay. No, we don't have that at a regional level, but I don't. So we were like, the highest ramps are being provided by thermal and hydro. And this is just showing us how the ramping requirement has decreased in line with the first graph here. We saw that uh, as the difference between the daily high and the daily low was decreasing, so our ramping requirements will decrease. How long is it amongst hydro and 15 minutes ramp. 15 minutes ramp. So amongst hydro and thermal, which provides more Yeah. So. In aggregate. In aggregate. In aggregate, uh, this is it. 
Yeah. So it's almost similar. But then the story changes once we go on a percentage basis because, I mean, thermal is 120 and we are talking about hydro, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 30, right? Like right now. So on a percentage basis, we see that hydropower is the most agile of them all followed by gas and in fact these are the two that are actually balancing RRE. So uh, since hydropower was a bit more agile and we so we decided to look a bit more at it and so this is the graph which shows how the weekly hydropower capacity first, firstly we have for the mornings the evenings separately and then the other time refers to 24 hours minus the time slots of 6 a.m. to 6, p uh, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the mornings and 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. in the evenings. And then the total time, the dotted line refers to the average 24 hours, how the capacity has been. So this is from 1st December to 26th of August yesterday. So what we see is that their hydro is continuously increasing. The general, because monsoons, because glaciers are melting, so kind of hydro runs almost to its must run status. So we reach a point where from graphically you can see buffer is around let's say two to three gigawatts between the morning highs and what it's being run at. So it is an important question, maybe in future we'll, we'll be at a time where hydro is already a must run, who is going to balance RE when RE increases in the system? Okay, yeah. So Utkarsh already talked to you about we had errors. So the data that we have, we try to reconcile it with the monthly reports from POSOCO. And for the generation capacities, we found that it is varying, but mostly we find that the data that we have is a bit over-reported than what we are getting from the monthly reports from POSOCO. Again, like we have three minute, five minute resolution data, we are assuming that the data is constant for those three to five minutes. But then again, if even if there's an error, logic says that over the course of it, plus minus, it should be almost zero. But we have, it tends towards positive. But, but you're comparing uh, daily MUs. MUs. Yeah, daily MUs. So we multiplied it, uh, kind of time, yes. So, then we also look for the same for our RE. So for RE, we had one simple thing, solar is in the day. And other RE, we don't know, like it can be 24 hours, it can be 12 hours. So, we, so on that basis of our knowledge that solar is just for those 12 hours, we try to tease out how RE, how much RE is being captured overall, how much of solar is being captured and how much of other RE, which includes wind, biomass, small hydro is being captured. So this is how it's looking like. Of course, we have made some assumptions, so, and we are still trying to improve upon this model. Then you can read a bit more on the discussion note. So we see that 60 to 70% of RE that is being generated in the country is being recorded by the tracker. So 30% maybe instrumentation has not gone online. Some other issues, especially for smaller hydros and others, maybe we don't have instrumentation for them. And this is on the basis of how much RE is captured in day versus how much RE is captured in night. So we see that and we are assuming here that the other RE that we mentioned previously, it's constant. It's a big 24 hours same. And yeah, finally, I'll hand it over to Rahul. No, we're taking it at the bus bar post ox, same as post -ox. Then how are you then back calculating losses and stuff that happens in the transmission lines to get to the... No, no, so um, it's equal. Can, can you hold off that question? But essentially, um, supply is always injected wherever it's injected. It could be within the state boundaries or it could be an inter uh, CGS, which is anywhere, and then it crosses transmission interstate to reach the state boundaries. So that is only for the demand that there's a difference between them. The generation that POSOCO will record as a daily is always post auxiliary at the grid level, which is exactly what the tracker, what their underlying data of SCADA is, is going to be capturing. It's the same feeder uh, data. The only difference is monthly reports have daily totals 
of MUs generated, and we're assuming the daily calculations done post facto are a little more accurate because uh, A, they have time to reconcile, and B, anytime someone says kilowatt hours, there's usually money on the table, so they're gonna get it right. So this is the report, and it, it's a very important question, but you know we, we, we'll come back to more methodological details in a bit. So this is the report. I will not attempt to go through all of it, but a few insights that are important for our discussion coming up in a few minutes, which is really what is balancing our grid, for how long will the current situation persist? And so we are a country of, I mentioned 350 plus, uh, yet the load met is about 180, so is there so much surplus? <coughs> what happens is 350 is the gross capacity in the country. What is injected into the grid is not the same because power plants, especially thermal, consume some amount of electricity called auxiliary consumption, which could be in the order of 8%. So you lose a bunch of generation there, then, of course, you have infirm. So out of your 350, somewhere in the order of 75 at the time of writing, now it's closer to 80, is renewable energy. So that is not treated as firm capacity as per planning. And it also, if you look at the tracker data, you will see that at the evening peak periods, it's contributing only a couple of percent to your generation. So it's not available at certain peak periods. Then you've got the interstate transmission losses, which is the difference, especially for CGS, entering the state boundaries. But even when you add up all of these gaps, there's still a huge delta. And that is all classified as something called outages. Now, it's a very interesting terminology, but these outages are of different types. Most people think of outages as the plant went down. So it turns out that outages are of several types. They're not only because of plant issues, technical issues, maintenance, failures, all of the above, but also if there's no fuel. You've heard about coal shortages. You've heard about gas supply problems. That is also termed as an outage, and it's categorized as such. Then you've got no demand. So if there is no demand or low demand, two separate categories, it's technical what the difference is, but this is essentially a demand side problem. That is also treated as an outage. The plant has been shut down for 24 hours, so for that day it's under outage, is how it's reported by the government. So we've looked at all of this over a 12-month period and categorize these across all the plants for which data are available. And we find that the majority of outages, this is just one day to give you an example, majority of outage was actually a technical fault, technical maintenance, but there is some fourth column, coal shortage. So lack of fuel is a problem. So what we then did was we said, let's call two types of outages recoverable, meaning your existing capacity can actually go meet that much demand. And those are, you get enough fuel and there's enough demand and a willing buyer. Assuming those are met, this much additional demand can be met. And so these are 12 months sort of snapshots, uh, representative days, just for this visualization. And it's in the order across gas and coal put together. Total is in the order of 30 GW. So that's the recoverable up to the point of the analysis when we had done it. So then what we did was we projected this and said, let's take that recoverable and then look at demand growth and alternative supply growth over the next few years. And we found that, and, oh, sorry, and this was for three different demand growth periods of 5%, 6%, and 7% from a demand perspective. So there's a separate calculation. Uh, my colleague Sahil is here. He has a paper on the demand growth in India for 2022 and 2030. We're using those numbers. And what we find is under one scenario, there's 81 different scenarios uh, in the paper, n-dimensional. We find that your surplus may disappear in about three years because your demand is growing by about 10 GW, even in fact higher most recently uh, per annum. Now, the elephant in the room that has been unmentioned is environmental, sorry, I have to point that way. Next, please. Flu gas desulfurization and other environmental norms. So this is the trajectory that is planned as per the CEA uh, reports and, and industry co consultative sort of action and ministry planning. And you'll notice that it's very tail heavy. We're sort of saying, wait a minute, if you're gonna do it, you should make it front heavy while you've got a surplus. 
because to meet these, you're going to need to take the plants down for somewhere between two to four, maybe six months if you're doing all the criteria pollutants. So otherwise, you're going to lose in the order of six to 12, maybe 14, 15 GW as downtime for retrofitting based on this sort of a schedule. So that's another issue. We don't even know how many plants would get retired. That's another question. Depends on the commercials and the economics. We have an expert here, Karthik, we may call on you to <laughs> share some thoughts in the discussion point of that. So now we're going to move to our uh, panel discussion. If I could invite um, Thomas and Mr. Mingani to join me on the stage. And uh, our other co uh, panelist is on the way. He's got caught in a ministry meeting with the minister and, and secretary. But uh, I believe that's where he is. But if I could invite you to please join us for some discussions. Um, and while we're doing that, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge and thank the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, who have supported this research. So as an institution, we rely on partnerships with our collaborators and, and supporters. So a thank you to them. So, sorry, next, um, next slide. Yeah. What can you do with granular data that you couldn't do otherwise? So this is one example where I want to show you just some first back of the envelope digging that we've done with an RE-centric sort of view. What we've tried to estimate is today your RE is being handled thanks to a couple of things. You've got flexing or cycling down your coal plants to a lower PLF as a capability. You've got hydro, which can go up and down. And in theory, gas could also be more easily swung. So we calculated every day between 11 and 2 p.m. Oh, sorry, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., midday. What is the lowest where you are at in thermal generation, which is coal, non-gas? And then we compared that to the maximum coal generation in 24 hours, left or right. Because the theory is you don't want to switch on and off a coal plant in a one day period. And so then we asked, what is that percentage? Clearly, it's going to be lower than 100%. Let's assume that number is, say, 90% or 85%. Then we say, why can't you come down to your limit, which is supposed to be 55%, and translated that into a certain gigawatts capacity. Then we added. Let's shut off all that gas in that time period. So we are doing a start stop for gas. And we added in 50% of hydro could come down, just as a thought exercise. Now, you could say, why don't you switch off all your hydro? Well, you've seen that hydro is almost turning must run. Maybe it cannot be switched off. Or maybe all of it can be switched off. Again, that's something we don't have an answer to. It's an assumption based, just an indicative. And what we find is, the summation of these three capabilities of balancing RE, midday. Why midday? Because we want to ask, how much solar can you inject before your system has problems? And what we find is, you've had in the order of, I mean, 50 to 60 GW of ability in your system to handle more solar. Now, on certain days, you can actually literally see January 26th, holy and other holidays in this sort of a schema. When Demand, this really shifts, but at least 45 GW. Now ask yourself what is happening to the RE trajectories, and we'll come to this hopefully in the discussion. How much are we going to grow each year? Now, as we grow RE, our demand is also growing, so your floor is also going to grow. So if, thought exercise, you grow solar at 25 a year, and your demand grows at 10, that means you're adding in the middle of the day an additional 15. That's excluding any wind growth or any other firm must run type of power that cannot be switched off in the middle of the day. So 45 divided by 15 is three years. So at three years, you're going to need huge load shifting or storage or curtailment, i.e. throwing away RE. That's the first order indicative that this is hinting at. That's what we're able to do as an illustrative example. Gachabji, uh, uh, welcome. Thank you. We're 
and in fact, uh, haven't started uh, the, the panel. So the questions sort of to the panel, to prime it. One is, of course, from our analysis and data, we have a wish list. Um, this is fantastic data the government makes available. So thank you. I mean, the government, uh, I think, Ganshamji, you've been responsible for getting some of these data out there, like the merit uh, data. So all scholars and policymakers thank the government for getting it out. But of course, we always want more. So what we want with data is more granular data, plant level data, state data, curtailment data. Nobody knows how much RE is being curtailed. We have estimates. We are not talking about commercial curtailment, but even technical curtailment. Um, we don't have, uh, other than aggregate or average numbers, we don't have that. Uh, another lesson or wish list is as we look at simulations like CERC and POSOCO have been doing on market systems, uh, security-based economic con uh, constrained economic dispatch, we have to go beyond CGS only. We have to go beyond thermal. As we had seen, hydro has turned into a must run. So your belief that you can just switch off your hydro may not be entirely true, at least all periods in the year. So we also would like solar versus wind versus RE breakdowns because today we are just lumping all the RE into one. Carbon, we want to move beyond static multipliers. What happens to the carbon emissions as plants change their outputs under flexing conditions? Efficiency loss, PLF linkage, these are all well understood but there's no standardized data for this. We haven't even talked about economics, which is a different, excuse me, different elephant in a different room. So to prime the panel, some opening sort of just thoughts, then I have some questions. We've seen that it seems handling 175 gigawatt RE is mostly doable. That's the finding of some studies. There's some limitations to them, but yes, with effort, good interstate transmission, because states already, RE is concentrated, are facing difficulties. So much of our effort has been towards the 175. One of the questions to the general panel is not 175, but we have targets just eight years later talking of 275, 350, and now 500 even, 500. That's where the real action is gonna start hitting you. The outages paper uh, report sort of talks, implies that the NPA problem, underutilization, in a few years will start to work itself out. Question is, do the banks and do others have that appetite for a few years? One year data obviously isn't enough, so a caveat for the tracker, for those who play with it, don't look at the decimal places or a number, look at the trends and the indicative, which are much more value. And importantly, the average PLFs aren't sufficient. They're meaningful, they aren't meaningful enough. So if you see gas was that steady blue line, very steady, it was about six GW most of the time, a little bit of up and down. So that would imply a PLF of about 25% on your gas units, little plus or minus. But it's not 25% across the plants. You've got a bunch of plants with zeros. Same in coal, your NTPC PLF is higher than others. Your pithead PLFs are much higher than non-pithead power plants, et cetera. So locational issues matter enormously, both for the grid and on commercial basis. Hydro we've already discussed, but hydro is not growing as much. So if it's been your savior thus far, you saw that on a percentage basis, it had the highest contribution for the uh, balancing. What do we do? How does it change? And yes, there is a duck in the room. The duck curve is visible. So one of the recommendations is we should start looking at net demand, not just the demand curve, but the net demand. So even if you have a lot of solar, and let's say we shift our pump sets to solar, it will not change the evening peak, which is where today's net demand peak is pronounced. So these are some of the questions. And now, um, turning over to the panel. So, any thoughts, reactions to the general sort of question that today's equilibrium is quite comfortable. How do you see things changing on either the demand front or the supply front, both in a couple of years time frame? Um, so before we jump into the questions, uh, you've seen in the invite we have with us Mr. Kancham Prasad, uh, Chief Engineer at the Ministry of Power. He's been looking over the operations, the monitoring, uh, 
keep all, the entire grid in some ways from the ministry uh, uh, with a technical background. You were at CEA before, sir? Yes. So has been in that hat as well. We have also Mr. Vijay Mingani, who's chief engineer for RE and grid integration at CEA. And with me, Thomas Spencer, fellow at uh, Terry, who's also been looking at this larger transition issue in, 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 in some detail. So thank you for joining us. So some, any uh, opening remarks from all of you, either about what you've seen or heard, or what you see, you know, as they say in the stock market world, future, the past is no predictor of the future. <laughs> Anyone who'd like to jump in? Sir? Actually, I want to start with a year of one thanks for the Merit India portal. Within 200, I will tell you the background. CA has a regulation for collection of information. Around 10 years back, we have regulation. We have around 68 formats. With the Merit India portal, we have made in around 15 days. There was a suspicion that the states are not following merit order operation. It was very difficult at that time to get the commercial data. Because that merit order data they never get to center, it will be given only to the state regulator only at the end of the year. So it was a very challenging exercise and ministry has given a window of almost 10 days us to make this application because our Mr. Conference was there. And at that time we thought how we can incentivize the people to give data. So we have given a new phrase. Tum mujhe data do mein paisa <laughs> <laughs> We have clearly shown them what is the advantage for them to give the data? We have shown them that by sharing the data, you will see the opportunity of saving in the power procurement cost. And we have given certain sometimes higher figure also to incentivize them. It was fine that within 15 days, compliance started coming. And at that time, I also told them, we are only giving the background data. After two years, three years, there will be a lot of people which will give you a lot of insight in this data. We are just giving a data framework, but there will be consultants. Like a lot of consultants are not doing now doing data scraping on this single portal. My KPMG consultant is giving consultancy to Telangana, and Telangana is saving daily 16 lakhs of rupees. Similarly, lot of people like Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, these are using this merit order portal for data scraping and direct insight and direct saving. And without giving any regulation, only giving three formats, data started coming. So whenever we talk about the data, like now I am starting collecting renewable energy data. Earlier, four months earlier, five months earlier, we have no visibility. So we have to incentivize them that why they should give the data. And once this type of insights come, they will be incentivized that this data can be used in their daily power system operation. So this will be the benchmark that this application will give them insight <coughs> for future operation also. So before we turn over, you used one word that latched on to many scholars in this room, which is scraping. Uh, and in the ideal world, it should be available through an XML or through a portal that the government allows you to download it more easily. Yeah. And I think it's a great start. We need even more granular data to re really get into the more nuances of ramping, time of day, etc. Because even what is there has some limitations or assumptions in, 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 in what is there. So this was an effort of gathering. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first of its kind. But um, a lot of scholars and, and researchers, like you mentioned, KPMG have been working with the CEA and others have worked. Uh, we have a lot of one-off efforts if we could institutionalize this is one of the requests and you know as scholars as a institution this is something that we do terry has done some of these things others cew has done some of this so i think this is a separate conversation that data is something that people may thrive on because that's their bread and butter but it's like you said it's really an enabler for operations but also for planning well <coughs> Thank you, Rahul, for getting me at the last moment as well. Delighted was, you could join us, sir. <laughs> I was struck in one of the meetings. <coughs> uh, definitely, uh, the data as such, uh, I mean, you can look it at in two ways. 
either it is a abstract data mm -hmm. which doesn't have any value second is the data if analyzed properly gives you a lot of value so i mean electricity sector as is per se if you if you if you go back around 15 years 20 years back everything was almost centralized in the entity who were looking at that particular activity whether it was generation transmission distribution or whoever entire kitty in fact i can recall even the year i joined in ca that was 91 even getting data from my counterpart division was very difficult the moment i used to ask for okay i need this information the reply used to be please come through a proper channel a later has to be approved by the chief engineer at that time and a later used to go to the other division and used to get the data <coughs> so from a compartmentalized concept now it has to be a transparent concept and this we started bringing in in ca as well as in other places as well uh, for last 10 years i think ims kab aaya tha you remember ims information management center i think 2005 2006 and that was the time when we started integrating the datas in 2014 the buzzword started about the transparency so you could see a lot of apps coming from the ministry almost and our target was at least one app per week of course we could not achieve that target but definitely on an average we were able to bring out 6 uh, 7 apps uh, in a particular year that continued for 2 years and then we found that okay now it is almost saturating and in that period only we came around uh, all these apps whether it was vidyut prabha tarang or uh, merit app all these apps started coming in then we started working on why not to have a have a national power portal what was the idea of that it was the idea was that all the power data should be housed at one place which can be used by anybody uh, incidentally we have been working very hard to populate that particular portal with all the kinds of information uh, i am not sure you can tell us what is the success rate but i particularly feel that still it has not succeeded to an extent what we exactly wanted we wanted that the all the kinds of data should be available on the national power, power portal which can be useful for all sectors whether anybody looking at the generation side or transmission side or distribution side or per se any researcher who is like to do some studies <coughs> in the college particularly these engineering students who wants a lot of data when he is trying to analyze or anybody for that matter uh, any everybody doing some statistics uh, statistical <coughs> data mining or data analysis those people they definitely need those kind of power data in fact i have been in ministry i have been approached by some of the students who are uh, taking their uh, research in 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 power sector and they came and met me and they were also finding it a lot of difficulty in getting the collecting the data about indian power sector as such something we could help out some we could not because of the the, the way the data is right now structured in the country so focus of the ministry has been that okay can we can we try to make it more and more transparent how can we populate more datas into the system which can be used by one and all of late we have in ca we have think uh, you can meghani can update you better uh, because we had started a system of registry i don't know whether that uh, guidelines was approved by the ministry and i i am i'm sure it might have started wherein all the generators were asked to register themselves uh, onto a onto a portal Uh, the idea again there was that why not all these the generation data after delicensing we found that the generation data is not even coming to this code to ca and we were losing a lot of informations so and, and the moment you start getting that kind of creating that kind of simple registry it's not a very complicated process you simply log in put your data and that generate a simple id for that and that id becomes your your benchmark just like what we have a aadhar number for ourselves the moment we put aadhar number and particularly uh, all your data whatever is there in that uh, system can be fixed by simply putting the aadhar number similarly 
uh, by simply giving that uh, generation ID, the entire data of that particular generating stations can be can be traced upon. So that registry plus what we wanted further is uh, can that be linked to certain parameters of the generation or transmission or or distribution. Lot lot much things is to be done. I think Brookings can can further do more research to guide us what exactly is the need of the hour and where we should really focus on. Of course, I can't say that uh, all of them are not important. Definitely, all of these data are important. But uh, given given constraints of the resources, we have to prioritize what is more required and what is less required, and that way we can proceed further. That is as far as the data part is concerned. You mentioned something regarding the renewable study, RE study and how far we are prepared about 175, 225, 275, 300 and even 500 gigawatt of RE. Uh, ministry has been going very cautiously in this and uh, in 2014, when 14-15 when we were really targeting about 175, all of us were not very sure how it is going to be integrated into the system. But after this study which was carried out uh, by NREL uh, with the US, I think uh, he is, Shikandir is already here, <laughs> so he knows the entire history. So in I think by 15, 2015 end, I think we concluded that study and we started getting a filler that okay, by doing these, these, these action points, we will be able to integrate this uh, this entire 175 gigawatt in a in a very uh, smooth manner. Those action points are well listed in that report, uh, and uh, those action points have also been completed. Most of them have been completed. So last year, in fact, uh, we uh, we thought that I mean 22 is right now approaching, but we don't stop at 22, and we have to really go for 27, 30, and that kind of time frame. So another co committee was constituted last year and that committee report is also final. I think it might have been hosted onto the ministry's website or maybe <coughs> hosted in, in a couple of, uh, I mean maybe in a couple of days, maybe within 10 days it can be hosted because that report has already been finalized and, uh, and there also uh, what the idea of that report was that we need to review what exactly was the study of uh, 2015. Did the recommendation go uh, and fetch the results what it was intended to? Second was the moment we go in a time frame of uh, 27, say 275 or 2030 or any kind of numbers that you say, how, how fairly we are prepared to uh, take care of that kind of situations. So all these recommendations are again uh, coming in that. Next step is with these kind of recommendations, we are also going to carry out these studies which probably we could not do at the time uh, when we were studying for 175 and that is the transient and stability study. These were the two st studies which were not carried out at that particular time. Number ch churning was there. We could uh, get to a good feeler and right now also because of a good mix of energy mix in the country, we do not face much of a problem. Uh, because its its uh, equation is 196 gigawatt of coal uh, versus almost around 60 gigawatt of wind and uh, solar. So practically right now we are able to balance them even with a, some kind of flexible operation of coal based generation. But the moment we keep on moving towards higher and higher wind and solar, uh, probably this ratio is going to be uh, not matching and may not be favorable. If it is not favorable then definitely we need uh, the concerns becomes more uh, how then which are the elements that can be helpful for balancing part. As most of you are aware that uh, if you really see the energy mix of the country uh, right now majorly we are dependent on coal with 196 or even 200 uh, gigawatt. Hydro again is either a uh, run of the river type or small pondage not going to be helpful much. Gas definitely we have something like 25 uh, gigawatt, but uh, hardly 12 to 13 gigawatt is uh, giving us some result with a very low PLF of around 25 to 26 uh, percent. Gas visibility is not there, uh, even if we depend on the imported RLG and all which is going to be very costly and probably it may not serve the purpose what was intended at that, at that time when we thought that 
uh, Reliance gas will be available and the capacity came during that time. So, gas again is not probably going to be the option. So, the only thing that is left out is depending on coal and whatever is in the pipeline. Second, what we are now thinking is uh, can we can we take advantage of hydro and that is how the push to hydro has started uh, and pump storage. Both of these are going to now come in the vision document of Ministry of Power as well. The task that is going to be assigned to, a, to us uh, officially, of course, we have already started working on this particular line that is promoting hydro and the pump storage which can take care of the balancing part. This seems to be a low hanging fruit for India because we do have a potential hydro potential as well as the pump storage can easily be built. Battery definitely battery storage is. Sir, we'll uh, come back to storage in a bit. There's a. Okay. Sir, okay. Uh, yeah. So I stop here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, let's move from the data and, and granularity in these to really these questions that Kanchamji and uh, Mingnanji had uh, sort of flagged. So, right now we are relying on the coal. Like you said, coal will do a lot of the flexing in some of these. How long will the current situation last or where do you see sort of trigger points, Thomas, maybe? Um, so one of the questions people always ask is, you need, there's some coal capacity under construction today. Very few greenfield is envisaged that, but will that be sufficient if you want to retire? I forget, Karthik, how much is the retirement plan under the emissions, uh, 30? 60 or adding, so I think it becomes 20. 60. 244 is what I think the target is. Yeah. 22. Yeah. 22. So, net net, you, you have some potential only. And then, but would you ever come to a point where you have to take a call that I need to build new capacity because I've exhausted? Because as the outages report and the other data show, we don't have as much slack as headline numbers would have claimed because your load met was only 180 and yet your capacity is 355. So, any sort of opening thoughts, Thomas? Yeah, um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. And although I will answer your question, I do want to make a couple of comments on the, the data portal that you have presented. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to very warmly congratulate you, uh, but also preceding you, the, the Ministry of Power and CEA, for this initiative that now goes back two years for putting the data together. Um, as you were making the presentation, I was sitting there with actually a bit of regret that it was not Terry that had done this, <laughs> very honestly. Um, I think it's a really wonderful initiative, so warmest congratulations to you and the team. Um, I think this is so important because uh, although the issues that you have highlighted in the, in the presentation of the data portal have always been important to the power sector, um, the, the power sector has always been driven by the need to balance demand and supply in every moment at every location in the grid. Or load shed. Or load shed. <laughs> exactly, and this is why I think it is so important. Namely, if, if you think of, you know, what, what are the uh, laws of the socio-economic uh, system that is the, the power system, it is driven by this need to balance load, with, uh, with supply at, at every moment in time. But I think the um, impact of that law in India has been muted in the, the, in the past, partly because you could load shed, partly because supply was always rather base load, and partly because uh, the load profile was always a bit flat with that, with that load shedding. And I think we are now moving into a world where that paradigm of you need to optimize the system uh, according to uh, the, the sub-annual hourly balancing is now becoming more and more important for, for India. With the growth of renewables, the potential for the load profile to change significantly and the, the growing inacceptability of load shedding. So that law of which shapes the, the power system is, is going to become more and more uh, constraining in India. And I think in that context, having this sub-annual hourly 15 minute data becomes so much more important than it, than it was in the past. Um, so uh, let me now come to your, uh, and, and there's, j just to finish on that point, there's 
many, many things that I think, you know, we would love to add to this kind of data portal. Um, certainly to take it down to the state level. Um, to add in more details regarding specific generating units, regarding uh, different uh, RE sources and so on. But it's a great start and I'm sure it will grow over time. Now, um, to, to come back to your question. Um, so, in the analysis that we have done at Terry, we, we certainly share uh, your conclusion that in the absence of further measures to make the grid more flexible, uh, the power system more flexible, we will be coming up against constraints in how much renewables we can integrate into the power system before too long. That means sometime in the early to mid 2020s. Um, if we continue with the trajectory towards 175 gigawatts and then, and then beyond that. A and obviously um, that, that creates the, the, the need to increase the flexibility of, of, of the power system. Um, I think of course the, the key thing is can you push the minimum generation uh, of the, uh, the, the coal-fired power plants lower in the, in the short term. But more importantly, can we generalize that requirement including to state plants? And I think actually Mr. Mengani made a very interesting comment where he said that in a federal structure, the use of transparency, the use of data to nudge states in the right direction is, is really uh, important. And I would see, for example, that the behavior of the state-owned thermal generating stations as an area where transparency could, could, could play this role as well. Um, Definitely the potential of, uh, of load shifting would allow us to integrate uh, more renewables and make better use of the renewables uh, production, um, particularly solar in the daytime, if we can shift some agricultural pumping uh, to daytime. And I think that's happening anyway because of the, the drive from the farmers to have daytime power. Like you said, it doesn't really uh, deal with the problem of the evening peak to the extent that that evening peak is not coming from pumping but from, from other sources. And certainly in the analysis that we have done, we have seen over the historical data a similar to trend to the one that you highlighted, which is that in the summer months of June and July, the evening peak is no longer an evening peak, it's a nighttime peak. Um, so it's becoming both later and it's lengthening. It's not a peak, it's a plateau at night uh, with air conditioning. And that raises, you know, real issues for the um, for the for the growth of uh, of renewables, particularly solar, um, which brings in the issue of storage, pump storage, battery storage. We will certainly need some uh, in the 2020s, which means we need to start now with the with the growth of storage. Um, and I think we're we're definitely moving in the the right direction with the tenders that have been brought out by SECI. The, documents coming out of CEA and the Ministry of Power indicating a very important role for storage in the sort of vision for the 2030 capacity mix. But definitely I would say that you know, it, it's 50-50 uh, in my view whether the increase in the flexibility of the power system will happen fast enough for us to meet our renewables ambitions or whether we'll have to take the, the foot off the brake a little bit in the early 2020s. <coughs> I want to add one thing. Please. Yeah. Like your question is regarding surplus power. We have observed in the last 20 years almost that the, our energy demand is increased gradually. But our peak demand is quite fluctuating. One year it become 1.2 percent and the next year it become 8.2 percent. Mm. So it is a very erratic, why we are doing, you have told me that only for 50 hours in a year this type of demand comes. With one year data. One year data With, yes, that's the, the caveat. Data. Yes. It is like that. <coughs> so fast analysis if I think by 2020. What is my target is 226 gigawatt. With the present time, I am not seeing it moving beyond 206 gigawatt. So there is a comfort on the demand side. But demand side is a, on the basis of assumption that what is happening, business as usual. Like UP at present also is having 18 hours power supply schedule in many towns. If this change to 24 by 7, there may be an issue. But that will add only around 3000 megawatt in that supply. Similarly, on the supply side, our only worry is solar, which we have assumed, it is energy side. What we are assuming, the solar rooftop, 40 gigawatt, which we are far away, away around 4,000 megawatt as per private sources, and as per government sources, it is around 2,000 megawatt only. So on the, and the evening and night peak issue, 
At present, what you are seeing, it is a distorted view on the system. It is a normal, it is a system operation intervention, which is moving the load from evening peak to night. In certain cases, like in UP, industries are allowed to take power only after 10 p.m. So our load, shift, this peak load coming only due to UP load in the night from 10 to 12 in summer months. If no intervention is there, at every supply is given, so it may move around 9 or 10 p.m. So it will not happen at around evening. So I think that's another area. We, we've been looking supply side. The whole demand side yeah. issue is a whole separate issue on load curve shapes. And also this concept of unrestricted demand. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what it is because we've never actually yeah. fulfilled it, let alone the economic growth and affluence and availability of appliances and aspirations or claims of warming of the earth. So therefore, we need more air conditioners. I, I, I mean, that's the cyclical argument in some ways. <coughs> You mentioned uh, in about the moves towards storage and, and clearly we need these for multiple reasons, not just RE, but also for uh, smoothening the peaks and valleys and a number of other benefits that these have. But it comes to that other elephant in the room which we alluded to earlier, which is pricing. Today, time of day pricing is something that is understood as needed. It has been discussed, but not yet implemented in very meaningful ways. And let me now explicitly distinguish between consumer time of day, retail, and wholesale. Retail consumer A will take a lot of time. You have to change the metering infrastructure. Delhi is probably the pioneer where all consumers over 20 kVA have to have it. But in most time of day implementations, the incentive price wise is very minimal. It's about one rupee ish. So most shifts don't occur. So that will take time, but on the supply side, 90-ish percent of power is transacted through PPAs, which have no differentiation between power sold at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. And so that leads to this question that if I have a storage technology and at a technology <coughs> level, policy should be agnostic, whether it's pumped hydro, lithium ion battery, concrete, I mean, there's so many things Thermal storage as an end user is another even, demand response. All of these may play. The question is all of them will have a cost. Where do you see the timeline as well as the spreads in time of day pricing wholesale wise? Power exchange, every time I say this, people say, but we have a power exchange. Well, that's not very representative. It's not very liquid either because power exchange shows so much volatility in pricing. Things shift so much. and so. Time of day is great. So, so yeah, Thomas, uh, for the wholesale side. Yeah, yeah, for the wholesale side, it's a good distinction. Actually, the power exchange doesn't shift at all. In the, uh, in the, if you compare it with the global perspective, so if you look at the sort of average daily peak to trough price differential, it's about one rupee per kilowatt hour, right? If you look at it in other markets it can be orders of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude. Um, so in South Australia, for example, uh, the wholesale market price can be as low as 10 Australian dollars per megawatt hour or as high as 10,000. Um, to draw in supply when, when needed. Um, and obviously, you know, the average market price is quite affordable, but you're getting that uh, in, in uh, <coughs> ERCOT in Texas, uh, there was reason, re last week, I think, a lot of Twitter action because the market price had gone up to 10,000 US dollars per megawatt hour. Um, so if we are going to get the incentives to come from the wholesale market, we have to be ready for that level of price volatility. And I think, frankly, that is still a long way off in India. Um, and this means that for me, the, the solution has to come in in PPA structuring and contracting um, in the, mid, the short to midterm. Um, so we need to start getting the practice of time of day PPAs, seasonal PPAs, uh, much more um, use of those instruments. Um, and I think the deep portal is a, is a very interesting move in that direction because a lot of the PPAs that you see there are seasonal, they, they have a time of, of day component. So I think more study of what kind of PPAs are being signed on the deep portal would help us give, it, give us a sense of what kind of contracting structures would help DISCOMs to meet uh, 
their supply demand gap without spending all out on a new coal-fired power plant with the 25-year fixed cost PPA. Because your analysis shows that you know, net load is, is going to... Relatively flat. What net load is going to uh, become more volatile as we get more renewables in the system. And this means that uh, given DISCOM's demand supply gap on a net load basis will always be you know, 10%, 15%, 20% of hours in the year. A new coal-fired power plant on a 25-year fixed cost basis is not, not going to serve that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Shelley? Yeah, please. Uh, I think you raise a very valid question regarding the PPA. 90% remaining with the <coughs> PPA and the TOD tariff, right? What is the way out? Hmm. This question I had been asking for the last four years, hmm. at least since I had been in this particular area. How do I really go about? Do I change the PPA terms? Can I change the PPA terms? Well, apparently states think that you can do anything <laughs> with the PPA. <laughs> right? So ultimately, after a lot of journey, uh, what we could only see is, uh, can, we, can we deepen the market? That's the only viable solution that comes to our mind. And in that direction, we have been moving forward. Mm -hmm. The only problem, of course, in that process only we had introduced the, uh, the portal from ministry. Right now, which takes care of your short term, wherein you have that uh, uh, time slotting as well as seasonal variations, etc., etc. But that's not enough. Because still, it takes care of only the incremental requirement of the discounts. If you really have to do a sea change or a, I mean, change to an extent of the entire PPA regime, then definitely uh, the entire power market of the country has to change. And if that has to change, that means you will have to have a product like futures, options, there has to be a speculators, there has to be, uh, I mean, all the financial <laughs> instruments has to be brought in. How do I brought in, bring in, in India? In the present framework, we, when we have two regulators, one is the fiscal delivery is being taken care by the CRC. Financial instruments are being regulated by SEBI. So there is a huge tussle between the two regulators in their jurisdiction and that is how the case is still lying in the Supreme Court. Probably you know the history about it. We have taken that initiative from ministry, how to resolve this particular case. Most likely, uh, tomorrow we are ending up to uh, some consensus between CRC and SEBI to agree to withdraw that particular case from uh, Supreme Court. The move, And we have now clearly demarcated, in fact, one, we had formed a committee in ministry to look into this particular aspect of the financial <coughs> markets as such. <coughs> the moment we are able to do this, and our target is uh, more, more or less, I can say, in a, in a time frame of next, if we are, I, I mean, we agree tomorrow to do this, then in a time frame of next six months, we should be able to introduce this kind of uh, system in the, in, the, in the country. Now, when it comes to this, then how do I take the PPS there? Can we have a capacity market? The, right now, the debate is going on between the capacity market or the energy market. Mm -hmm. Should India move from an energy market to capacity market to take care of these PPAs? So we'll be taking a decision on that very shortly, but at least 99% chance is there that we may even move towards the capacity market to take care of all these PPA. And the moment capacity starts getting traded into the into these financial markets, then both things are going to happen. The PPA gets turned into the, the financial products. At the same time, whenever these are going to be uh, required or the traded as far as the, the, the licensees are concerned, they can get this power through the dam, that is day ahead market or the intraday or the balancing market or whatever market that comes into, which can easily be that, 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 part, will, uh, that part of the fiscal delivery can be taken by the CRC. We are also going to have 
a chapter on power market that's what we are trying to design and electricity act will try to cover that chapter in the power market and uh, i mean what we are trying to do is can we because simply taking a tod meter for a generator and trying to set a tariff by a regulation probably that's not going to help that's our thinking and that is how we want that market to decide this kind of time of the day tariff and the moment the volume starts getting deepening into the the dam or the the day ahead or the intraday or the uh, or term ahead market probably the, this will automatically keep on happening so that's the vision what the ministry is looking at today. Mm. so the challenge with markets is people either love them or hate them depending on what the equilibrium looks like when supply is very high wholesale prices fall and so markets look brilliant and yet like you pointed out thomas that you know you have swings that some maybe are actually a feature not a bug of of what you need so one side is what happens in a couple of years because let's move forward a couple of years because the next few years are mostly already planned so now demand has grown we don't add so much cold capacity but we do add a huge amount of re and so the sur surplus starts to go away so now we are approaching not uh, only equilibrium shifting but now the regional national versus state issues kick in so these are all the tracker shows national data but what is it uh, what is it uh, what percentage comes from the south 45 more than half the gener re generation came from two states in india at particular times of the so one of the challenges that one of the senior officials there told me was look you can give me infinite transmission but when i'm surplus is when my neighbors are also surplus and when i'm deficit or evening peak for example is when there is no liquid market available and so what how do you see this transition th this sort of granularity also playing out uh, certainly uh, i i fully agree with your observation we shouldn't regulate a time of day tariff that would be a, a, a dangerous move it may help short run but it may not help going long term but then uh, how do we handle the winners and losers because with any transition it's not that people necessarily say that the long term equilibrium is bad it's how do we get there actually one like ppa case i want to add that the shortage scenario and in the surplus scenario how people accept the ppa condition are very different <laughs> in today's condition when we are setting surplus there are the discom saying to a wind generator that okay i will accept your repowering proposal but i will purchase only power for 5 year and there is a renewable <laughs> generator who do not want to enter the market so unless we have some protected players or preferred players who do not want to enter the market dynamics do not want to take risk they want a perfect cash flow to suit their financer our market cannot become deep what is happening unless renewable renewable have to realize its own value and it's like we are talking about storage gas we are comparing for last since last 3 month it is not viable but i see a scenario that before storage my gas can become a very viable option for balancing because cost of the gas is now come you have taken analysis up to 2030 us shale gas at the end my indian border itself at half the price of not a half around one third price i can balance the scenario of the gas but what is becoming happening we are operating under constant like my energy mix study it assumed that my capacity of gas will remain 25000 i will operate it at 22% because gas price will remain 7 rupees 50 paisa these are a continuous evolving market so storage before storage already existing resources can be used for balancing for that i recommend that the renewable should come into the market without any protection renewable should not think that only through a contract or ppa type of thing they can enter into market and they they can they can have a higher value also at within 2 rupees 50 paisa 3 rupees only there will be a time if i structure my ancillary market correctly my market design correctly it may get twice the price same renewable but given the enormous enormous i mean admirably ambitious growth of re 
to extend Thomas's point on volatility, you now often have seen in other countries, thanks to RE, negative prices yes. for, for energy. Hmm. And it's not clear either from a LDC or a system level perspective, but even also from the developer's perspective, are they willing to go down that risk path where if you don't have, I mean, people like PPAs not only for high profit margins per se, in theory, a market and a PPA should come near each other, otherwise something's out of equilibrium on one of the two ends. But, but it's really that, that data there's that risk. There is a data insight. From 12 July onward, there is a complaint of curtailment. We find that there is a lot of power and even after best effort of managing within the regional grid, X state is not able to absorb all the wind power. And there was a possibility that wind power can come to the market. But structurally, nobody is ready to get the power into market. And then we part blame particular state for curtailment sector by making best use of my flexibility. There is a certain limit like 55% shutdown is there or 70 percent curtailment is there but even after there there is a limit for a particular state like you have told when i am surplus in monsoon season my neighbor is also surplus but my grid is so strong that i can move this power to northern part of the country but it was not possible because people are not ready to come into the market their contracts are like that i am married to you i cannot move out of that even if the possibility of selling outside is available so before we open it up to questions, there's a lot of folks I'm sure waiting. <clears throat> a last thought on just this tracker and visibility and apps. I mean, the government has pioneered a lot of apps. Thinking of consumers, this is the other side, not just on time of day pricing, but overall behavior, uh, appliances and consumption. Uh, are people really ready or even interested to know enough about electricity to change their behavior other than through pricing or load shedding as instruments. Always people were engaged through these two instruments. Everyone wants a lower bill, ideally not through the Delhi solution, but also through energy efficiency. But we also uh, have had load shedding as a reason people were engaging with the grid. Now in a smarter sort of a future, do you think not directly this uh, tracker, but similar platforms where now consumers are told, plug in your electric vehicle at this time. Because electric vehicle is one of these very interesting beasts, which A, is very large in energy requirements, and B, often has some flexibility of when it can be plugged in. So that's just one example. Now, again, this is where you have to s say, do I believe the targets? One extreme target was 100% electric vehicles by 2030 as being sold. If that happens, that's an enormous impact on the grid. But some people are saying, well, it may not happen so quickly. So two wrongs make a right, or it's a math double negative sort of may, may be happening. So do we think people are ready for thinking about electricity so differently than they did in the past? No. <laughs> Straight <flat. laughs> Is that an Indian? Uh, but no. no. So, so, the, this so, so I'll push back and just say, Every time someone says India doesn't do X or does X, maybe niches are there. And a niche in India is bigger than a country in Europe. Yeah, so I mean, my perspective on this, and it's also informed a lot by what has happened in developing countries, is that you can do something with you know, slab-wise time of day pricing, um, which could have a seasonal component as well. Uh, so people will run their washing machines at, at night if the tariff is much lower there and so on. But in the, in the aggregate, it doesn't make too much of a difference. I think the evidence from developed countries which have tried to get retail comp uh, competition in there is that even if you try to make switching suppliers as simple as possible, people treat utilities as sort of a, a, a locked-in expense. The, the, the time cost <coughs> of, of researching is, is so high. So I'm not super confident, and this holds in India but also globally, that people will stop treating electricity as something that is just there. You pay for it, but it's there. And they don't think about it too much. It does have a potential in industries. Yes. Yes. Domestic probably may not have because, I mean, the time you need electricity, you will definitely switch on. But industry does have a lot of potential the moment you go for the DRs, demand response, and introduce demand response in the industries. 
we need a price signal also. Yeah, price signal has to be there. Price that's one of the bottlenecks we have for storage. That, that's true. That's yeah. true. Actually, correct price is also required for domestic sector. I remember in CRC, we are the regulator. See, the enabler is something different. Yeah, enabler is, does, does your distribution company have the information, right information about the consumer? Probably no. After so that PM. means you will have to have some kind of smart meters already installed so that you keep on, I mean, two-way communication is there. Sir, but commercial is ready to adopt, like in CRC, we were the regulator, but when we are told that after 5 p.m., if you take a photocopy paper, you have to get the power cost at a double price or 1.5 times. So we started stop the printing after 5 p.m. Because commercial is totally convenient for the implementation. But the DSM study for the domestic consumer could not find a benefit because pricing for the domestic consumer is not correct. If the retail tariff for the domestic consumer is right, then he can give you a better DSM. So, um, thank you, thank you, everyone. I'd like to open it up to questions. We've had very patient folks waiting. Vivek, please introduce yourself very briefly and a, a <coughs> short question, please. We're already over time, but we do yeah. want to. Yeah.